apple and a salmon snout and hinder haunch. He rumps and rut, born to bear victory, bellowing in greatness, idol of the Oxford, the prime, demon Finbenach. When Maeve saw him and knew he was better than any bull of her own, there was great vexation on her, and it was as bad to her as if she did not own one head of cattle at all. So she called McGrath, the herald, to her, and begged him to find out where there was a bull as good to be got in any of the provinces of Ireland. I myself know that well, for there is a bull that is twice as good as himself in Ulster at the house of Dada, son of Fachda, in the district of Cooley, and that is Don Cooley, the brown bull of Cooley. This was the brown bull of Cooley. Dark, brown, dire. Haughty with young head, horrific, overwhelming, ferocious, full of craft, furious, fiery flanks narrow, brave, brutal, thick breasted, curly brown head, cocked high, growling, and eyes glaring, tough mane neck, thick and strong. Snorting mightily with muzzle and eye, with a true bull's brow, and a wave's charge, and a royal rat, and the rush of a bear, and a beast's rage, and a bandit stab, and a lion's fury. I dare swear, for the gods my people swear by, they will not take him away from us till they take him by force. In that case, we will take him from them by force. And this was the cause of the great war of the Brown Bull of Cooley. At that time, the men of Ulster were lying in their weakness, which meant they were under the curse and the enchantment of a woman they had once ill-treated. Till the ninth generation, the shame that you have put on me will fall on you. <clears throat> and at whatever time you most want your strength, at the time your enemies are closing on you, that is the time, the weakness, of a woman in childbirth will fall upon all men of the province of Ulster. And so it happened. And of all the men of Ulster that were born after that day, not one escaped that curse and that enchantment, but only Coo Cullen. Maeve and Alil consulted who would be the best man to put over the whole Connacht army, to lead them and to show them the way. And they all said Fergus would be the best, for he'd been king of Ulster 17 years until Conquibar put him out of the kingship. And he had stopped on in Ulster after that until the time Conkybar killed the sons of Ushnik, in spite of the guarantee he had given them. So Fergus was made leader of the whole army. But as he went on, a great love for his own province and his home came on him. And instead of going northwards, he turned to the south. And while he was delaying the army like that, he sent messengers into Ulster to give warning and news of their coming. His age of no great matter. For he did great deeds when he was but a soft child. He is young enough yet, and I think it will not be hard to find someone of our <coughs> own men that can get the better of this wild hound, for he is but the one body to wound or to put to flight. You will find no one among your young men, and your champions, and your fighting men, that will be able to put down Cú Cullen. Logged, son of Nush, that had gone into Connick with Fergus, went secretly to Cú Cullen and told him of all that was going on in the camp and of the dread of him that was on all the men of Ireland, so that they did not dare to stir out alone, but that he himself was true to yet. The war goddess, the Margu, came and sat at a stone pillar at Tower, and gave a warning to the brown bull of Cooley. Have a care, and keep a good watch, my poor bull, or the men of Ireland will come on you, and will drive you away to their camp. And when the bull heard the warning, he brought fifty of his heifers with him, and went away to the valley of Schlieff Quillen. And the men of Ireland came on, bringing the herds of cattle they took on the way, where there was no one to defend them. Some man of you must go out and stand against Kukala to save the army. It is not I that will go. It is not I that will go. It is not I that will go. It is not I that will go, for Kukala is no easy man to stand against. And they were for going round by the head of the river, but Maeve made them cut a way through the mountain before them, so that it might be left as a lasting disgrace to Ulster. And it is called the Gap of Ulster to this day. Then Cú Cullen came there and stood on a height and shook his spears and his sword before them, so that great dread came on them. 
And that night and the two nights after it, the men of Ulster were afraid either to eat or to sleep or to make music. For Cúchulainn had killed so many of their men before the clear light of each morning that it was as if the whole army was melting away. Someone must go and make him another offer. I would never consent to give in to a woman, but it be under a woman's rule. It is what he wants, that one man of the men of Ireland should meet with him and fight alone each day. And while the fight is going on, he will make no hindrance on the army. But it may, they may march on. But so soon as he has killed the man I set against him, the army must stop and make its camp until the morning of tomorrow. I will agree to that, for it is better to lose one man every day than a hundred every night. And who will go and make this agreement with him? Fergus must go. go. I, I will, will not go. go. Then a young lad, Esher Cummel by name, of the people of Maeve and of Allen, made ready his own chariot. Ah, what side are you going, Eto Cummel? I am going with you, the way I might get a sight of Cahollum. <sighs> if you take my advice, you will not make that journey. Why so? Because if your pride and his pride meet together, some misfortune will surely happen. I give my word not to anger him in any way. And now, who call it, I come from the men of Ireland to agree to your conditions. It is then that one man should meet, alone with, should meet with you alone and fight alone each day. I agree to keep my part of the bargain. And let us stop talking here anymore, or the men of Ireland will be thinking you're doing some treachery on them. So Fergus went back to the camp. But Edda Cummel stopped for a while looking at Cucullin. What are you looking at? I'm looking at yourself. Well, take your eyes off me and go after Fergus. And maybe you think yourself a better fighting man than the one you are looking at. You look to me as good a fighting man as I ever saw for one of your age. But you would not be thought much of amongst trained fighters and growing men. It is well for you. It is under the protection of Fergus you came here. Or I swear by the gods my people swear by, you would not go back safe and sound to the camp. You have no right to say that for what you want of the men of Ireland. I will give it to you, for you asked for a champion at a time to fight with, and I myself will be the first here tomorrow. Come then, and however early you may come in the morning, you will find me here before you. Driver, turn back the chariot, and let us return, for I swear, by the oath of my people, I will not return to camp without the head of Cúchulainn in my hand. So they turned back again towards the sea. Oh, that chariot that was here a while ago has turned back again towards us, Cúchulainn. It is Edward Cummel come back to challenge me. And it is not I that will fall in this fight, but bring me my arms, for it would not be ready, right for me not to be ready to meet him. So he went to meet him. And what are you come back out for? Of the sheep. What are you come back for? I am come back to fight with you. I am loath to fight with you, for it was under the protection of Fergus you came here. His sword cut the sod clean away from under Edward Go back now, for you have had a warning. I will not go back until I have fought with you. The edge of the sword cut the hair close off his head to do no blood. You may go back now at least. I will not go back until I have made an end of you, or you have made an end of me. Well, if you are set upon that, it is I must make an end of you. <laughs> and cut him through and through. It was not right of you, my foster son, to kill someone that came under my protection. <coughs> While he was doing this, the rest of the men drove away the bull with great haste to the camp of the men of Ireland. And this was the greatest affront that was put on Cúchulainn through the whole of the war for the brown bull of Cooley. Fighting men were sent out every <coughs> day for a week <coughs> and killed them all. And one day... Go, lay to the camp, to my friends Lovett and Fergus and Ferdia, and say you are come for me, and ask them which of the men of Ireland is to be sent against me tomorrow. So Leg went. And when he came back... It is your own comrade and fellow pupil with Scahawk, Furbeth, your blood friend, is coming against you. For he has only recently joined the army, and he's brought four-fifths of his men with him. And Maeve has promised him her daughter, Finnevere. And he has drunk from her cup and been fed by her hand. And it's not everyone that Maeve gives the aid that she gives to Furbeth. I am sorry to hear that. For I think worse of a comrade of my own coming against me than of any other man. And when Furbeth came out to fight against him in the morning, Cucullin did his best to make him give up the fight for the sake of their old friendship. <coughs> but Furbeth would not listen. He did not look to see did it hit him or not. <coughs> that was a throw. And this is the way Furbeth came to his death. Alan made 
made the camp fool put on his clothes and wear his gold circle on his head and go with Hinnabar, and he bade him stop as far back as he could. The way Cúchulain would not know that it was the king that was in it, and then Finnabar was to bind him over to their side, not to fight any more against the men of Ireland. But when Cúchulain saw them, he knew the fool. Oh. Oh. And because oh. Finnabar had taken a share in the treachery, I myself would have to go and get satisfaction from his death, and tell Coo Cullen not to make an end of Lorene, but only to give him some punishment he will not forget. So, when Lorene came out at the breaking of the day, Coo Cullen rattled him so hard that the dung was sh shaken clean out of him, and he was left there with the life still in him. But to the end of his life, Lorene couldn't empty his bowels properly. Yet he is the only man of all who met Cúchulain on the Thornbow Cooley, who escaped him alive. It is not I that will go. It is not I that will go. It is not I that will go. It's not one of my family should be sent to his death. <laughs> then Maeve asked Fergus to go out and fight him. It is not right for you to ask me to go up against the young boy, and he be my own foster son and pupil. But Maeve pressed him so hard that he could not but take the work in hand. And early the next morning, he went out to the ford of fighting where Cúchulain was. And now, Cúchulain, for the sake all I did for you, and all of Ulster, and all of Conquer did for you in your bringing up, let you give way before me today, in the sight of the men of Ireland. I am loath to give way before any man in this war. You need not mind that, for when the great last battle of this war is fought, I will turn and run before you. And if I turn and run, then the whole of Ulster and Ireland will run before me. So Cúchulain agreed to do that, because it would be for the profit of Ulster. And he bade Laig McReady his chariot, and presently, as if he'd been beaten by Fergus, he gave way to him in the sight of the men of Ireland. He's, He's running before, before you, Fergus! Follow him, Fergus! The way he will not escape you! I will not, indeed! I will follow him no farther. And if you think I did not do enough, I did more than you, or any of the rest of the men that fought Cúchulain up to this, I will make no other attack on him until all the men of Ireland have fought with him one by one. So that was the end of the fight between Fergus and Cúchulain. Then it was settled by the men of Ireland that it was Ferdia, son of Dara, the great champion of the men of Dunnan, should go out and meet Cúchulain the next day. For they had the same way of fighting, and it was with the same teachers they'd learned the knowledge of arms with Scothach and with Uhuk and with Aoife, and neither of them had an advantage over the other, except that Cú Cullen had the feet of the gay Bulga. But Ferdia had good armour to protect him against any man he would fight with. So they sent messengers to bring Ferdia, but he refused and would not come, for he knew it was what they wanted of him, to fight against his friend, his companion, and his fellow pupil, Cú Cullen. Then Maeve sent the druids and the satirists to him, that they might make three hurtful satires and three hilltop satires on him, if he would not come with them, that would raise three blisters on his face, shame and blemish and reproach. Then Ferdia came with them, for the sake of his good name, for he thought it better to fall by spears than by satires, and great rewards were offered him, if he would go out against Cúchulain. I will not go to this fight, not without some other securities, for this is a fight to be heard of till the end of life and time. If you were to offer me the land and sea, I would not take him without the sun and moon along with him. <coughs> you need not wait longer than today and tomorrow before you, you will get your fill of all sorts of jewels of the earth. Ferdia, so soon as you have killed this hound of feats, I will give you Finnebear of Champions, Queen of West of Elga. Ferdia gave in to her then and he bound her on the sureties for the fulfilment of her promises of the reward, and she bound him to fight with Cúchulain on the morrow. Then Fergus got his horses harnessed and his chariot yoked, and he went out to where Cúchulain was, to tell him of all that had happened. My welcome before you, Master Fergus. I am glad of my welcome, my pupil, for I have come to tell you who it is that is coming to fight you at the morning of tomorrow. I will listen to that. It is your old friend and companion. The man that led the use of the arms with you, Fardia, son of Dara, hero of the men of Daman. I give my word. It is not my wish, my friend, to come out against me. And now you must be careful and ready more than any other time. For there was none the like of Fardia that have fought you up to this. 
I am here hindering and delaying the four great provinces of Ireland from the beginning of winter to the beginning of spring, and I have not drawn back one foot before any man in that time, and I think it likely I will not draw back before him. Neither has Ferdy any fear on him before you, now that his anger is stirred up, and besides that, he has good armour to protect himself with. Enough, Fergus, and let me not hear any more of that story. I was always well able to stand against him in any place or on any ground. It is not easy to get the better of Ferdy, for he is fierce in fighting and has the <coughs> threat of a hundred. There will be a sharp fight when myself and Ferdy come to the fort. Oh. It will not be without being told in stories. Who come of the red sword, how great it would be to me than any better reward for you to carry proud Ferdy's purple cloak eastward. I give my word and my oath, because I myself will get the victory over Ferdy. Then Fergus went back to the encampment. At the same time, Ferdia went to his tent and to his people and told them how he was bound by Maeve to fight with Cuchulain on the morrow. And he told how he had bound Maeve for the fulfilment of her promises if Cuchulain should fall by him. It is not happy in their minds the people of Ferdia's tent were that night, but gloomy and heavy-hearted. Ferdia slept through the beginning of the night very heavily, and when the latter end of the night came, his sleep went from him. The thought of the fight was pressing on him. And he bade his driver to harness his horses and to yoke his chariot. But the driver tried to turn him from it. It would be better for you to stop here than to go, for my liking of it is not more than my disliking. Be silent, boy, for I will not be turned from this journey by any young lad. But I will go to the ford, the ford the ravens will be croaking over. And I will fight with King Holland, and I will ruin his strong body and crush the courage out in the way that he will die. It would be better for you to stop here than to go. For it's not gentle your threats are. Your parting will be sorrowful. There is one to whom it will be a sickness. Grief will come of that meeting with Cú Cullen. It is long, it will be remembered. It is a pity for him who goes that journey. It is not right what you are saying. It is not for a brave man to refuse. It's not in our race. Now we're too long delaying like this. Let us set out now to the ford. So Cú Cullen reached the ford. And Ferdia drew up on the south side, and Cuchulain drew up on the north side. And Ferdia bade Cuchulain welcome. I'm happy at your coming, Cuchulain. I would have been glad of that welcome up to this time, but today I do not take it as the welcome of a friend. And Ferdia, it would be fitter for me to welcome you than for you to welcome me, for it is not right for you to come out against me. For this is my homeland, and you are the intruder, and driven out are women and children, are young men, are troops of horses, the flocks, the herds, and the cattle of the province of Ulster. Enough! What has brought you to fight with me at all? For you are my servant boy, to make ready my bed and tie up my spears. That is true indeed, but it was as less an age than you I was used to do so. But that is not the story that will be told of us after this day, for there is not a man in the whole world I would not fight today. What has brought you, O hound, to fight with a strong fighter like me? I have fought with heroes, with chiefs of armies, with hundreds before now, and what I have to do today is to make an end of 